This is a recording for your notes on speciation or how do new species arise? How do new species come to be on planet Earth? So the topic is basically speciation, how new species arise. But before we start, we need to be start by clearly defining what are we going to be considering as species. And a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed. Basically, they can reproduce with each other, they can have sex, and most importantly, they can produce fertile offspring. There are several organisms that can interbreed, but they never produce offspring. So this is the second factor. You have to interbreed, but have offspring that is fertile and able to continue reproducing. So basically we are going to be talking about how we get new species. All right? Now, one of the things that we need to understand is that as adaptations, as over time, we notice that every from generation to a, another generation, many things uh, might change in organisms. So as these adaptations and differences accumulate, driven by the environment, let's remember that the environment is what drives all the change, there's going to be a point where the organisms become so, so different that they are not going to be able to recognize each other one way or another and reproduce with each other anymore. When you get to this point that an organism, a group of organisms became so different that they do not recognize each other and they cannot mate anymore, so it's change, change, and then they cannot recognize each other, then we consider these two to be new species. Now, what is the basic unit of evolution? It's not the individual, because remember that individuals are going to die. But populations and the offspring of all the individuals, they keep on going. So we are going to need to define what a population is now. A population is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same general area with the ability to reproduce. So they have to be able to interbreed. So let me give you an example. Let's talk, for example, about the squirrels here in Fairfax County. Fairfax County. And the same species of squirrel, the gray squirrel, is found in Maine. However, the Fairfax population is going to be a different population, same species, Maine and Fairfax. They're still the same species, but they are going to be different populations because the likelihood that a squirrel in Maine mates with a squirrel here in Fairfax is almost zero, given that they have to, uh, they are going to be separated by major barriers such as the Potomac River, the Susquehanna River farther north, and maybe even the Hudson River farther north. So, and major barriers that the squirrels will not be able to move along. So, again, the population is going to be important. So even though you have a species, a species is made out of different populations. A species is made out of different populations. In theory, they are all able to interbreed, but from the practical point of view, from the evolutionary point of view, we look at a population as a group of individuals, the same species, living in the same area with the potential to really get to mate with each other and exchange genes. And let's remember that populations have generic variability. We introduced the idea of the gene pool before. Basically, all the traits that are in an individual, all the genes, all the little alleles, and that's part of the gene pool. So populations have generic variation, and that's all genetically determined. Now, how does a population become a new species? That is the question. How does a population become a new species? 
For this, what you need to have is that a population, an original population, like right there, needs to become separated. It needs to become separated, separated, so that these two populations that result here cannot mate, cannot mate, cannot reproduce. If they cannot mate, if they cannot interbreed, that means that they are not exchanging genes. There is no gene exchange. There is no genetic information exchange. So over time, these two populations are going to become more and more different because any changes that are happening in that population are not going to be shared with this population. All right? So that is very important. And this is the concept of reproductive isolation. The, in order to become a new species, in order for a population to become so different that it cannot reproduce anymore with another one, reproductive isolation is the essence. Right? So this is what we call the first step. Now, what sort of things are going to have an impact on their reproductive isolation? And there are three main factors. One is geographic isolation, behavioral and temporal isolation, and those are the things that we are going to discuss now. Remember again, reproductive isolation is the essence. So let's see how geographic isolation can lead to reproductive isolation. Remember, this is what we're looking for. So a good visual here, you have a population. Notice that all the dots inside are the same, so it's the same species. In theory, they are able to uh, reproduce with each other, but you have a physical barrier that somehow is going to split that population. And these physical barriers can be things like rivers, mountains, bodies of water, uh, could be anything that basically physically prevents the movement of one individual to the other place. If you can prevent this movement, of course they are not going to reproduce with each other, and anything that is happening on this side is only going to affect this side. And anything that is happening here is going to stay only on this side. And over time, things are going to start changing. So imagine that you have a mutation that occurs here. So that mutation is going to stay on this side because they're not reproducing. Imagine that you have an influx of a couple of new genes that come with some birds or something that came into this population. If they are not reproducing with the other ones, these new traits are only going to start here. So over time, these two populations are going to become more and more and more different to the point that they will not be able to reproduce. And when I say over time, I'm talking in the geologic scale of millions of years. Sometimes, depending on the species, can be much shorter time. Sometimes it can be 10,000 years. But again, it depends on the uh, generation time of the species. Oh, of course, the type of geographic barrier has to, is gonna depend also on the type of the organisms. If we are talking about birds, Depending on the barrier, if it's just a wide river, birds can move around. If we are talking maybe about a beetle that doesn't fly, then that river becomes a significant barrier. So you have to think about the type of organism. If it's a plant with very small seeds that can fly and be dispersed by wind, the seeds will be able to move. But if it's a plant with big seeds that don't get moved around by the wind, for example, then you're going to have a more limited distribution and it's going to be hard for that, those seeds to move to the other side. So 
the reproductive isolation that was caused by geographic isolation results in genomes that are going to start changing and becoming more and more different because there is no communication, there is no exchange between the two of them. A good example of this, I want to give you some specific examples, this is what happened in the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon has been uh, working the river, so if you have ever been to the Grand Canyon, this is the Colorado River that makes the Grand Canyon, and the Grand Canyon is a plateau, it's a flat area there that the river has been digging deeper and deeper and deeper over the last couple million years. However, it has been only in the last 10,000 years that the river has gotten really, really deep, making the trek from one side of the canyon to the other side of the canyon kind of a very challenging option. So what do we have here? Before the river started really carving the canyon, this was a flat area and there was one species of squirrel living all over here. As the canyon got deeper and deeper and deeper, the two populations of squirrels became more and more difficult for them to kind of visit each other and mate. And as of now, these two species, these two, the, the one species that was present originally, now is two different species. One is called the kaibab squirrel and the other one is called the abert squirrel. And they are slightly different, they still look very similar, but if you put them together they don't recognize each other in terms of all the natural behaviors that they do in order to mate. So they live in opposite sides of the Grand Canyon and they had a common ancestor when they were living together but the reproductive isolation led them into become different species. Another good example of this is, I don't know if you're familiar with Pangaea, that's when all the continents were together in one supercontinent and this is about 300 million years ago, 300 million years ago. When Pangaea was all together there was a particular species of a large wing bird that didn't fly necessarily over there. When Pangaea separated into all the different continents that we have, these widely distributed bird species became very distinctive species because they couldn't exchange genes anymore. And what are these? In Africa you have the ostrich. In Australia you have the cassowary that is like a very similar to the ostrich and in South America you have the reas. If you look at them side by side it's like oh wow yeah you can tell these are about the same but they're not identical anymore and the geographical isolation as the continent of Pangaea broke into the different uh, uh, continents and separated these three different species of birds became very, very different. Pangaea, or actually before Pangaea was Gondwana. All right. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll try to have in class uh, a map so you can see how the continents have changed. The second factor that contributes to the creation of new species, the process of speciation, is temporal isolation. Basically that the time of reproduction is different. Whenever organisms are ready to reproduce is different and that prevents them from mating normally. So the idea is that something is happening environmentally, the cues are different and for some reason organisms are one species populations that were supposed to mate at the same time, now the mating is off. So I'm going to give you a good example of this and it has to do with a bird that migrates that we have around here called the robins. I hope you recognize them from being outdoors. They are very popular in uh, around our area. These are the robins 
and the robins are migratory birds so in the winter they usually migrate south in the winter they usually migrate south however in the last 100 years or so we have noticed that some populations are staying around in the cities and are not migrating they are staying here not migrating because the houses provide a warmer environments we landscape so we pro we have yards where they can find earthworms they are eat insects and earthworms so we are kind of by landscaping and having homes we are changing a little bit the conditions so we have a group of these birds that migrates south and we have a group that stays here what's happening now the birds that migrated start coming back to this area they start coming back to this area when the weather improves and they usually return to this area in May. The migrating birds return to this area sometime, maybe April, May, when the conditions are perfect, April, May. What happens with the birds that are not migrating? The birds that are not migrating and are staying here and as soon as the weather improves they don't need to fly back they are already here so these birds that are not migrating start mating so let me make a note here the not migrating start mating early in the season mating early in the season and they mate of course among themselves a month later, here come, arrive, the migratory ones, the ones that did went south. When these ones that went south arrive, they cannot mate with these ones because they are already in pairs and they are already raising their chicks. So the migratory birds, who do they get to mate with? Only with all those that have migrating. So what's happening here is that we are creating a big separation, temporal, between two populations of robins, the ones that stay here and the ones that migrate. And they are all, this hasn't been happening for very long, about 100 years since the development of cities, but ornithologists, people that study birds, are starting to notice a few changes in some of the genetic makeup of these birds. Finally, the last, remember all this is geared towards what causes reproductive isolation. And the last one that we are seeing is very common is behavioral isolation, where the reproductive behavior changes. So you know that a lot of organisms have what we call a mating courtship, very common in birds, uh, in mammals, in frogs, that ribbit, 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 a lot of insects like the crickets, the cicadas, all that is, all those sounds are for mating behaviors. And they recognize each other based on their songs for the birds, the mating calls for the frogs, or the chirping of the crickets. So they recognize each other and the species. Oh, I can add here also the lightning bugs that we have in the summer. Only the males produce light and the pattern of flashings is different for different species. And we have in this area around five different species and they, you, they can recognize each other just based on the flashing pattern of those lights. So what's happening? We know now that a small mutation can cause a big change in some of these calls, songs, the smells, and the overall behaviors. Simple mutations can really change it. And if you have a group that is changing, then obviously they're not gonna recognize their other ones with the different song or smell. 
and they are gonna start in the process of speciation. So behavioral, temporal and geographical are three of the factors that contribute to reproductive isolation which is the beginning of new species. Now one question you might have is how fast is all this happening? Well, there are, depending on the organism, the conditions and the place, there we have noticed that there are two patterns. One that we call gradualism, where the change is very gradual. So if we make time be in this axis here, this is time from old to recent, recent on the top, you can see from this butterfly that as we move up this way or this way, the ch changes are very gradual, very gradual, until you end up with these two very different ones. This is called gradualism, slow changes over time. The other thing that we see based all this mostly on the fossil record is what we call punctuated equilibrium. I love to say that, punctuated equilibrium. And what's happening here, you have a species, an ancestor, and for a long time nothing happens, and then in a short time there is a drastic change. In a short time, a drastic change. So notice, this one becomes that, this one becomes that. But this change here happened in a very small period of time. Let me show you a better image of for this. So gradualism, you're going to start seeing more, more of these trees. Notice that this represents horizontally changes in morphology, how the shapes have changed. And this is time. So as time progresses, the change, the shape changes. So here I have a hypothetical organism that you find in the rock layers. So as you move up, you know they are more recent and you can see how this organism starts changing little by little. Just a pentagon, some lines inside, lines inside outside, and then the lines outside become more curvy. So this is relatively gradual change over time. What do we see in the fossil record for punctuated equilibrium? Again, here is a high idealized group of snails. Again, we have time here. And notice that if you go through the strata of rock here, one, two, three, these snails have not changed much. This, 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 they all look about the same. So basically a period of no change. And then, in a very small period of time, we see all of a sudden that this species, chum, you have a very different, not very different, but a significant change in the morphology. So this is what we call punctuated equilibrium. So you have a period of no change, that you can call it stasis, then you have a period of rapid change in a short period of time, maybe a couple million years, five million years. And then again, it remains with no change for a while. So no change, change. Now, what is causing these rapid changes? So we have a graph here, again, time and evolution representing change there. And if you see here, rapid change, rapid change. That means that the environment is changing very rapidly through this period of time here. Through this period of time, the environment change. And then notice, no evolution here, totally no change. And it's because during this time period here, the environment did not change. Then, we have another little period here where we see a drastic change, evolution. And then again, flat line, meaning no change. 
again indicating a period of stable environmental conditions. So these are kind of the connections and implications that we are seeing. When environment doesn't change, of course, there are no selective pressures and organisms stay the same. And then during periods of change, we see a lot of selection for different traits and organisms change. We see those, these two patterns, punctuated and gradualism, in different types of organisms in different parts of the world. So we know that both cases exist. I have another one here, you can see the same thing. Um, these are foraminiferans, these are uh, unicellular creatures that live in the ocean. They are part of the plankton and they are beautiful creatures and they are preserved because they have a small shell made out of calcium carbonate. So we can see here through time, so remember these are rock layers no change, no change, they look very similar. And then in this narrow amount of time, we see a change in the shape to more elongated shapes. Uh, for the record, the person that proposed and discovered this punctuated equilibrium is a famous paleontologist, Stephen J. Wool. Uh, he died unfortunately in 2002, a while ago, but he was very popular in pop culture and he was even an invited guest on The Simpsons. I have a few more images to illustrate the same and I hope that you can take the time to look at them uh, calmly in the uh, slides, but the same process over and over again. And again, punctuated equilibrium here, representing periods of time of change, sorry, and no change, change, no change, change, no change. Indicating, suggesting that the environment has times where it's not changing much. The same process for gradualism, that the fact that the species are constantly changing, constantly changing, that implies that the environment is constantly changing or affecting the species in those places. With all this, just want to close up with some patterns of evolution that we see when we look at organisms. And one of the patterns that we see is what we call convergent evolution. We mentioned this before. And this is not very useful when we are trying to see how organisms are related to each other. Because convergent evolution is caused when you have two or more unrelated species that become more similar because they have adaptations to the environment. So they start in different places, different places, but then because of the environmental pressures, they end up in the same place, like this. This is what we call, and is caused by analogous structures. So we like to identify convergent evolution because that allows us to value the importance of the environment in the selection process. The only problem with this is that this does not, does not, provide any information about common ancestry. So that's the problem with this, no information about common ancestry. The patterns that we like to see because they provide a lot of information about common ancestry is what we call divergent evolution. Divergent evolution is when related species, let's start right here, group of marsupials, become more and more different as they adapt, as they are selected for, for different environmental conditions. So how do you interpret this? This is the original species here, marsupials. And again, time is represented in the vertical. And as time goes by, you have a species here. This one changed into the wombat and the kangaroo and you probably recognize that that happened in Australia. Here you have another branch that became the Tasmanian wolf. 
Then we have another ones and another ones. And basically from the common ancestor, they start changing depending on the environmental pressure. You are gonna be working uh, with cladograms and this kind of trees and I just want to introduce it to you here. This is a common tree that is gonna show us how groups of organisms are related to each other. So again, time, this is old, this is new. At the top is the present, of course, and organisms represented there. And these lines with traits show when the trait appeared, when the trait appeared, when the trait evolved, basically, that we see it clearly defined. So let me give you this. So here is a common ancestor. This is an organism that was the common ancestor to all these creatures. Common ancestor to all these creatures. As time went by, here is the common ancestor in this corner to this organism that is a hagfish, a very primitive fish. But from this common ancestor here, you have the hagfish that is still alive, but this common ancestor kept on changing and gave rise to all these other organisms. Now, at this point in time, so more recently, this is the common ancestor that gave rise to what we call fishes today, but at the same time, speciation events led to other organisms that look slightly different. So anyone, anytime that you see a corner there, that means you have a common ancestor. Now, these other traits that are put here tell you when the trait evolves. So right here, the trait jaws evolved. That means that this is the first time that we see jaws in the fossil record, and before here, we did not have jaws. So you can conclude that the hagfish that is here, this had no jaw because it evolved before. So, for example, can you tell me who has claws or nails? Basically, anybody from here up will have claws and nails. That means lizards, pigeons, mouse, and chimp. And of course, these represent reptiles, birds, and mammals. And as you can see, salamanders that are a representation of what we call amphibians do not have claws. Let's do one more. Fur and mammary glands. Who has fur and mammary glands? Of course, anybody from here up, and that means all the mammals. So this is how we're gonna use these diagrams, and they're very straightforward and just take practice. So, to close up, we have a cladogram there. Can you tell me, by looking at this, the letters represent species that we have right now. Remember again, this is the arrow of time, and here is recent. Who is the closest relative of species D? Closest relative of species D. That would be C. Because if you follow their ancestry lines right here, number five is the common ancestor for C and D. So it's not E, even though they are right next to each other because E is related to this other branch. Who would be the next closest relative to D? For that, you need to go back and here is another common ancestor. So, of course, these two species here would be the next closest relatives to those two. Right? So, these are like two sides. And it's important to recognize that these are the species that you have now. And the numbers, and notice that the numbers are all in corner points, 
that represents a common ancestor that we don't have anymore. They are not living. These common ancestors are not living, but we know that they exist because we can find them in the fossil record. With that, I think we had enough. You have enough. We are going to keep on working on this in class and the practice. Please, if you have any questions, make sure you write them down so we don't forget. So I hope this helps. Thank you for listening and I'll see you in class.